Welcome to the YouTube channel for Sunset Canyon Baptist Church. My name is Russell Dixon and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor here. We hope that this week's message encourages you to seek Jesus and we pray that it helps you to grow in your walk with Him. You know, the only way we can bring messages like this both to our YouTube channel and to our podcast is not only through the generosity of our church family, but also through the generosity of you, our extended family. So if you would like to support this ministry financially, you can go to our website at sunsetcanyonchurch.org and then simply click on the button that says give. Now, here's this week's message. begin today by asking a really deep theological question, and that is, how many of you have seen the movie Zoolander? Anybody? Anybody? All right, for those that have seen it, you understand why I said that's a deep theological question. Well, if you have not seen the movie Zoolander, uh, it's a pretty funny movie. It stars Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson, and it's a movie about the modeling industry. And these two guys, both Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson, are male models, and uh, Derek Zoolander is who Ben Stiller plays in the movie, and he has been the male model of the year for like a thousand years running, and he is known in the movie for his infamous look that he calls Blue Steel. I've got a picture of what he looks like with Blue Steel. That's his Blue Steel look. Now, believe it or not, your pastor not only was a baseball player, but I may or may not have dabbled in modeling myself, and I have a, a picture of me doing Blue Steel as well. You're welcome. <laughs> that picture's gonna come back to haunt me one of these days. Put your phones away right now. My modeling career turned out like my baseball career, king of toast. But in the movie, there is a hilarious scene where uh, they have the male model of the year contest at the beginning of the movie. And Derek Zoolander had won male model of the year for like 18 years running. And Owen Wilson plays Hansel, the up and coming, he's so hot right now, male model. And shockingly, at the beginning of the movie, Hansel upsets Derek Zoolander and he wins the male model of the year. And then they cut to, after the, the, the award show, they cut to Derek Zoolander running out of the amphitheater. And I want you to check out what, what happens. I don't know. I guess I have a lot of things to ponder. Hey! The results are in, amigo. What's left to ponder? Woo! Oh. Nice comeback! <laughs> so if you couldn't hear him, he said, I guess I have a lot of pondering to do. And then Hansel said, results are in, amigo. What's left to ponder? And then, of course, as it happens many times in the movie, Derek Zoolander is speechless and has no response. But that reaction right there, what Derek Zoolander said, is what I want to draw your attention to because of the fact that he lost this coveted competition, he leaves thinking he's got a lot of pondering to do about his life. And I would like to propose today, as we continue in this series called Rhythms, and today I want to speak to this idea of what it means to pursue your God-given purpose in life. I would think that many of us, if we're honest, have had times in our life where we felt like we have a lot of pondering to do when it comes to our purpose. Well, fortunately, I'm here to tell you today that just like Hansel told Zoolander that the results are in, amigo, and there's nothing left to ponder. 
And we can look to God's word to be confident beyond a shadow of a doubt that we can walk in God's purpose for our life. Now today's message, uh, for some of you that have been in church for a long time, you may be sitting here thinking, Russell, I, I know I'm fully confident that I'm right smack dab in the middle of God's purpose. And, and I think that's amazing. My hope that today, as we walk through these observations from God's word, that it will just be further confirmation that you're walking in the center of God's purpose for your life. But on the flip side, if you are finding yourself wondering or wrestling or questioning, my hope is that today our time together will help you to discover that finding God's purpose for your life is not always as complicated as we make it out to be. So let's look to God's word. Now today, we're gonna bounce around in scripture a lot, so if you're normally someone who follows along with your Bible, uh, I would encourage you to follow along on the screen. It's probably gonna be a little easier, but I wanna teach you five things today from scripture that will help us to be fully confident that we are smack dab in the middle of God's purpose for our life. Before we jump into the, the scriptures today, I wanna give you the big idea of today's message, and if you've got a listener guide, I would encourage you to jot this down. The big idea is that God created you on purpose for a purpose. Can I encourage somebody today that you're not here by accident? That it's not just by happenstance, that it's, it's not just a, a happenstance thing that you are here, that God created you on purpose for a specific purpose. And here's what I found, the more we seek after him or the more we seek after God, the more he will show his purpose for us. Now today, these five things, these are the things that we can be confident that God created each and every one of us for. And the first thing that we can be confident that God created us for, number one, is to abide with him. To abide with him. And we see that in John chapter 15, verses four through six, which says this, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. The first thing we need to know is that God created us to have a relationship with him, to walk with him. Now, God did not need to create us. I think it's important to establish that. God was and is completely sufficient in and of himself. Yet in his kindness, he chose to create us so that we could have a relationship with him. He also, when he created us, gave us the gift of free will. He gave us the gift to choose whether or not we walk in that relationship with him. Now, some of us grew up in a home where maybe we were drugged to church and we didn't have much of a choice in our home growing up. And while I know that sometimes that creates some resistance or some um, negativity, but I also think that has very much positive results on the other side. How many of you know that if you train up a child in the way they should go, that prayerfully when they get old, they won't depart from it? I've seen that in my own life. I was drugged to church as a kid. I battled a drug problem as a young adult, but by the grace of God, because of what was instilled in me in a young age, it came to fruition as I stepped into my young adult life. But no matter what kind of home you grew up in, God does not drag us into relationship with him. He gives us the gift of free will to choose not only to accept salvation, but here's what I found, that relationship with him is a daily thing, isn't it? It's not just a, yes, salvation is a one-time decision, but we have to wake up every single day and choose to remain in him as that scripture tells us. Now that, that idea of remaining in him, there's a lot of facets to that. There is a personal facet and then there's also a corporate facet together as the body. Now I hear a lot of Christians nowadays that say, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. That's a personal thing, that's a, that's a me and God thing. Well in part, that's true, that it is a personal relationship with God. And so part of our abiding with him or remaining with him is our time in prayer, it's our time in the word. Those are obvious things that are a part of our faith. However, 
I also think that when people say, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian, that's like saying, I don't need to go to work to be employed. Anybody ever tried that out before, just not going to work? Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna go to work. It's all good. Last time I checked, that probably wouldn't go so well, would it? Or on the flip side, another example would be, I don't need to take care of my kids to be a parent. As much of us at times would like to just kind of let them do their own thing, especially if you have a toddler, that's not exactly going to go too well. We can't leave David alone for two minutes without him destroying the entire house, right? So in order to, to, to say that the, the going to church is not necessary for our abiding in relationship with him, that doesn't add up at the end of the day. Now, let me be clear. I know that Many people, especially in this time right now with COVID and Omicron, I know that there are a lot of folks that need to be careful and we have a lot of people that actively stream at home. I'm not talking about that, but there's a lot of Christians that just completely check out from any form of corporate worship. And this is not a COVID thing. It, COVID revealed what was already going on in society. Church attendance was rapidly plummeting and then COVID exposed this crisis that was going on in the modern American church. It's, it's funny that when COVID first started, online attendance skyrocketed, but now it's not exactly the, the, the math doesn't add up. It's not that it's holding strong. And yes, people are coming back in gatherings, but there are also not nearly as many people streaming online at home. And I share that because what happens in this space is so important for how we abide and walk in relationship with him. We encourage one another, seeing each other's faces, smiling, being a part of this community together. It is so important, and it's a vital part of how we grow in that relationship with him. I read a study recently that, that they surveyed these average American churchgoers, and out of this group surveyed, they would consider themselves regular attendees. Like, hey, I consider myself to be a regular church attender. And do you wanna know how many times a quarter or how many times a semester this average American churchgoer attended church? Once out of every six weeks that they consider themselves an avid churchgoer. It's scary to see what's happening in our churches. Yet so much of how we abide in relationship with him is choosing to suit up and show up, right? Now there is also a personal facet to that as well. We have to commit, because I know plenty of people that come to church that it's a Sunday thing and they check a box and they walk out the door and it's, they're not daily pursuing him in their own personal private time. So both of those things, both personally and corporately, they're all a part of how we get filled up as Jesus followers to abide and remain in relationship with him. Here's how I would illustrate this. How many of you are tea drinkers? Anybody tea drinkers? Okay. I'm not a tea drinker. Gary Thomas is a tea drinker. Um, I found that out. Actually, I knew that about him, but I was reminded of that this past week. But any of you ever been in a rush to make a cup of tea? Like where you're like, you only have like two minutes and you're trying to hurry. What do you do? Like you, you kind of like dip it really fast, right? You rush as if that's gonna make it go faster, right? But I think many times we treat our spiritual relationship like the two different ways that you can make a cup of tea. Some of us do this, right? We just drop it and go, right? It's like, oh, I'm gonna drop in and say one prayer, I'm gonna read one scripture, and I'm just gonna kinda drop in and drop out, right? Well, what kind of results do you get when that's your approach, right? As opposed to this passage in the book of John is telling us to remain or to abide. And if I just leave that in there for a while, what's gonna happen eventually, and I'm gonna leave it down there, not only does that tea start to soak in the, the water and it changes the color of the water, but it also changes the chemistry of the water, right? And what starts is water here in about 20 minutes, if, if one of you tea drinkers wants a glass of tea, you can come have yourself one, because why? It starts to change the chemistry from the inside out. And here's what I found. I think any of us that are here today that are Jesus followers, I would like to think most of us would say, we want God to do something through our life, right? 
I think if any of us would want to know what's my purpose, I want God to use me. Most of us, if we had a hand-raising session, we would all say, yes, I want God to do something through me, but here's what I found. God can't do something through you if he doesn't first do something in you. If he's not doing something in your life personally, if you're not abiding with him, then we cannot achieve the purpose that he has for our life. Are you abiding with him today, both personally and corporately together? The second thing we need to know, if we wanna walk in the purpose that God has created us for, God created us to pursue excellence and serve him in everything. To pursue excellence and serve him in everything. And we see that in Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. This is the ESV version. It says, for we, y'all say we, are his workmanship. Another translation says, for we are his masterpiece. And then it says, created in Christ Jesus for, what does that say? Good works. God created good works for each of us to do. And then I love where it says there, it says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now there's a lot there that Paul is telling us, and I wanna share with you a couple of things. First of all, he tells us that we are his masterpiece. Can I encourage somebody today that if you're here and you're you're feeling inadequate, if you're feeling insufficient, while yes, none of us are sufficient to achieve salvation, can I tell you that, that you're God's masterpiece? That God didn't make a mistake when he made you, that he created you exactly how he wanted to create you. And then it also says that he created us anew in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared for us to do Beforehand, And then the key part of that verse is it says at the end that we should walk in them. What does that mean? Well, that means that we have the choice whether or not we're gonna walk in those good works, right? That we don't necessarily have to, to walk in those good works, but we have a choice every single day to pursue the good works that God has created for us to do. I love in Colossians chapter three, verse 17, it says, and whatever you do or say, Do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Notice the emphasis that Paul makes, at least when I read this, the emphasis that I read was, and whatever you do or say. So it's not just the things that we like to do, it's not just the things that we wanna do, but whatever we do or say, we're doing as a representative of the Lord Jesus. Why is that key that he says, we're doing it as a representative of the Lord Jesus? Well, when God gave us Jesus, was that his second best? No, right? It was his very best that he could give us. And so if God gave us his best when he gave us Jesus, the very least that we should do is give him the very best of everything that we have and everything that we are. And we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 25. It says, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs but only one person gets the prize. And then it says, so run to win. That one translation doesn't say this, but I interpret this as if you ain't first, you're last, right? Anybody heard that phrase before? We've all seen Ricky Bobby, right? Now, that's not necessarily saying we're competing against each other, but what it's telling us is that we wanna pursue excellence and give God our very best with everything we put our mind to. And then it goes on to say, they do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it, meaning Jesus followers, do it for an eternal prize. What does that mean? Well, as we serve the Lord, as we give him our best in everything, in whatever we do or say, we know that on the other side of this life, in eternity, we are pursuing eternal rewards that await us, amen? that it's not just for this life, it's not just so that people look at us and think, wow, what a great person. We are doing it for eternal rewards that await us. And then in Mark chapter 10, we see a very clear picture of how we are to go about giving our best. And this is speaking of Jesus. It says, for even the son of man, meaning Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. You wanna know God's purpose for your life? Serve him with your best and then trust him with the rest. 
If we serve him with everything that we do and everything that we are and trust him with the rest, then God will honor that. And not only will we see that in our own life on this side of eternity, but we will walk into eternal rewards on the next life. If we want to live like Jesus, we need to serve like Jesus. Amen? If we want to live like Jesus, we need to serve like Jesus. Now, as you heard me mention earlier, we are going to ordain at the end of our service our six new deacons, and I actually am going to give them one of these that I'm about to show you as a tangible representation of what they are called to do. And for those of you that don't know, a deacon is a, is a servant of the church. They are called to serve. Now, just because some are called to serve as deacons doesn't mean that all Jesus followers are not still called to serve, amen? That if Jesus set the example and says, for even the Son of Man came to serve and not to be served, that's a calling to all of us to serve his kingdom. Now, here's what I find. This is just a, like a little cloth napkin here with our church logo on it. And what I find is that many modern American Christians walk into church like this. Who knows what this is? We use a lot of them in our household. Who knows what this is? It's a bib, that's right. And what's the mentality of a bib mentality? It is feed me, serve me. The favorite note of a lot of a modern American Christians is me, 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 me. I know that's probably not a note, whatever the proper music term is. There's a reason why I'm not on the worship team. But that's the mentality of, of a lot of American Christians. But here's the great part. There's a small difference between a bib mentality and then if you just take this bib and move it down just a few inches, it becomes what? An, an apron. Or another way of looking at it would be, as Michael Clark called me, a cruise ship director earlier. Now I really look the part, right? But imagine if this, y'all are all laughing now, you can't take it seriously. <laughs> Trying to make a serious point. Close your eyes and we'll close in prayer, I'm just kidding. But imagine if this was our mentality. I'm here to serve and not to be served. And yet so many times we walk into church and we want our preferences instead of saying, whatever the Lord needs me to do, I'm here to do. It's not just deacons that are called to serve, it's all Christians. Are we serving and giving God our best in excellence? Number three, God created you to care more about who you are becoming than what you're doing. To care more about who you are becoming than what you are doing. We see this in Romans 12, verse two. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Notice the order of that phrase there. It says, let God transform you first into a new person. Focus first and foremost on becoming new, on pursuing righteousness. Then it says you will know God's will for your life. I think many times, especially for young people, we can spend a lot of time and energy going, what am I supposed to be doing with my life, right? I think we've all asked that question at some point or another. Am I supposed to go to A&M or Texas? Now, I don't, I don't wanna hear any, uh, you know, that may seem like an obvious choice for some. Am I supposed to go to Baylor or Texas Tech? Am I supposed to work at Deloitte or PwC? We can spend so much time and energy over the little nuances of what we're doing, and I believe that at the end of the day, God cares far more about who we are becoming or our character than he does the specifics of what we're doing. If you've got your listener guide, jot this down. God cares more about our character than he cares about our career or our college. And we should be focusing first and foremost on our character. And it's as we focus on our character and God will reveal our calling. So many times we can spend all this time and energy worrying about those little nuances, and I think God just says, hey, I want you to look like me. We see this in Colossians 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. 
Notice that he says, whatever you do, again. What does that mean? I think that gives us a lot of freedom. Now, I'm not saying that there are not certain gifts that God created us for in certain lanes, certain windows. That's the title of today's message, is to work your window. I think God created a window of purpose that we're all created for. And so for me, like if I was like, yeah, whatever I do, I'm gonna go sign up for the music team. That would not go well, right? If I wanna kill church attendance, I'm gonna sign myself up for a solo, okay? That's, that's not what I'm talking about. And I'm also not talking about doing immoral things. Like, obviously God cares about us honoring him with our actions. However, instead of spending so much time and energy worrying and focusing on the little nuances of our calling, what if we focused on our character first, and as we become like Jesus, he will reveal to us the specific nature of what it is that we're supposed to be doing. We see that in Proverbs 16, 9. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. How many of you are thankful that God walks ahead of us, that he redirects our life even when we try to go our own way? And here's also what I found. It doesn't matter what you're doing if you're not becoming like Jesus while you're doing it. You could have the most noble passion on the planet But if you're not striving and I'm not striving to become like Jesus while we're doing it, then we're ultimately gonna find ourselves unfulfilled in what it is that we are doing. There's this great story about a baseball player that was drafted as a catcher and moved quickly through the minor leagues. He got to the major leagues really fast. It was like two years, which is pretty fast in that that organization. Uh, He started as a catcher in the major leagues for a few years, and I want to say his third or fourth year, he made the all-star team as a catcher. And then after he made the all-star team, the brass or the bosses of the organization approached him and said, hey, we think that you should move positions. Now, if you're an all-star catcher, it would be easy for you to go, why would I want to move positions? Clearly things are going all right, right? Right? But this player cared far more about being a great baseball player than he cared about what position he played on the team. And he went back to the organization after thinking about it and said, sure, you can move me. And the organization moved him from catcher to second base. And that player is a guy named Craig Biggio, Hall of Fame second baseman. Imagine if he cared more about his position than he did just the kind of baseball player that he was? What if we cared more about being a great Jesus follower than we did what little specific place that God has for us to serve? Number four, God created you to be different, to be different. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses four through seven. It says this, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways. Are you picking up on a key word already? But we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. That passage goes on in a multiplicity of ways. It talks about how the hand can't tell the eye you don't matter, and the eye can't tell the foot that you don't matter. God created each and every one of us as Jesus followers differently. And he did that on purpose. And so I wanna encourage you today, if you're sitting there feeling like, I don't really feel like I have the same giftedness as them. Particularly, can I talk to our young people for a minute? I think that many times we spend our lives scrolling through social media going, well, if I could just be them, then my life might be better. Or if I could just be them, or if I could just have what they have, But let me encourage you today that God created you different on purpose. God created you different so that you can make a difference. If he just wanted a bunch of the same people, he would have created us all the same. But God created each and every one of us different. Why? So that we can be the body of Christ and we can help build his church. Now, not only did he create us different from other Jesus followers, but he also created us different to be different from the world around us to be set apart, right? We see this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse nine. It says, but you are not like that. You are a chosen people, a royal priest, 
a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That verse right there is amazing. The fact that God called us out of darkness so that we can show the world the goodness of God just by being set apart and different from the world around us. And then in John chapter 15, verse 19, it said, the world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you're no longer a part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. And then look at what it says. So it, meaning the world, hates you. So when we receive opposition from the world around us, we shouldn't be surprised, right? Why? Because God called us to be set apart and to be different. And so if you find yourself with a circle of friends or a circle of influences and their choices are not reflecting Jesus, we probably should do some evaluating about our circle of friends, amen? Particularly for young people. Young people, if your friends around you are not making decisions that are causing you to be set apart, run, don't walk, okay? Find a new group of friends to hang out with because ultimately you become who your friends are, amen? Last thing I wanna show you that we can be confident we're walking in God's purpose is that we are created to be a light for him. We're created to be a light for him. Matthew chapter five, verse 14 through 16 says, you are the light of the world. Notice that it doesn't say Billy Graham is the light of the world. Notice that it doesn't say Craig Rochelle is the light of the world. Now, yes, they are the light of the world, but that word right there is speaking to all of us. We, each and every one of us that have a personal relationship with Jesus, we are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. And we see that also in the Great Commission. That's the ultimate call of the Jesus follower. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you even to the end of the age. The ultimate goal for all of us is to be a light, to be a light, to be Jesus to the person in front of us. Do you know that God's master plan to reach the world for Christ, it's not from stadium speakers, it's not necessarily from pulpits, although that's part of it, but God's master plan, he has no plan B, his plan A that is his only plan, do you know what it is? It's you and 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 you. It's all of us, right? We are all a part of God's plan to reach this world for Jesus. Now you might ask, that, that feels like a significant calling. How do we go about doing that? It feels daunting when you think about how many people in the world don't know Jesus. Well, I wanna give you a great resource if you like to read. It's a book that I'm currently reading myself. It's a book by Kyle Eidelman and it's called One at a Time. And the principle is that much of Jesus's ministry was built one person at a time. You see so many times in Jesus's ministry, he has a crowd gathering around him and then one person emerges. And when we read the scripture, almost always it focuses in on Jesus's interaction with that one person. If we wanna make it simple, if we wanna be a light, we need to focus on one person at a time. One person at a time. If we can just be Jesus, if we can just be a light to those people in front of us, one person at a time, God will use us to help be a part of changing the world. I'll close with a story. And if you read that book one at a time, you'll probably read the story because that's where I read it. It's about Mother Teresa. Now, before you go, wait, 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 that's a little bit of a lofty goal. If you know anything about Mother Teresa's ministry, she built her life on serving the poorest of the poor. She was not a, a Billy Graham stadium speaker. She was not someone that was known for her captivating communication, but she became known 
for how she loved people one at a time. And in this particular story, it talks about how she visited Australia and she encountered an Aborigine man and the exact quote from her who, again, she lived her life ministering to the poorest of the poor. And her exact quote about this man was, he lived in squalor unlike I've ever seen in my life. It's saying a lot from Mother Teresa, isn't it? And so Mother Teresa asked this man, can I come in and just clean your house? And the man kind of didn't want to let her in and he fought it, he fought it. And finally he, he agreed to let her come in and start cleaning. And as she was cleaning his house, she discovered a lamp in the corner. It was dusty, dirty. It was clear it hadn't been used in years. And she asked the man as she was kind of dusting it off. She knew the answer to this, but she wanted to ask him anyways, do you, sir, do you ever light this lamp? The man thought about it for a minute and said, no. And Mother Teresa said, well, why? The man said, I, I don't have anybody to light it for. So Mother Teresa said, well, what if I can help change that? Would you light it then? He said, I probably would. So Mother Teresa arranged for the, the nuns in that area to come by and start visiting him every day. She continued to go on and clean and then went about her way and went about her ministry and time passed and she didn't completely forget about this man, but she was on to the next person loving the person in front of her. And about two years went by and she received a letter from Australia. And as she opened the letter, she read these words that said, because you lit the lamp in my life, that lamp that was once dark still shines today. How'd she do it? She loved the person right in front of her. We want to know our purpose for our life. We just need to love the person that God puts in front of us. Imagine the impact we can make on this world as a church if we just loved the person in front of us. If you want to be a light to the world around you, love the person that God puts in front of you. Amen? And here's the beauty of it. When we do that, when that's our goal, when that is our purpose, guess what? We don't have to ponder anymore. The results are in. And if we follow what God has clearly put in front of us, we can be a part of lighting the lamps in other people that need it. Let's pray.